improve productivity, profitability, and um, gain competitive competitive advantage uh, through technology. Um, we are, uh, you know, first and foremost, uh, a Microsoft partner um, for many many years, uh, gold partner um, status, and and several different uh, competencies. Um, and an Intex partner, we've. Um, been a premier partner with Nintex for I think um, as long as Nintex has had the partner program and it's been a huge part of of our uh, business and our value that we help customers with and that is to um, look at opportunities to streamline um, and add automation through technology uh, to business processes and to systems whether those systems are or human systems or, or um, IT systems. And we've been uh, a partner of Nintex for, um, I think since about 2008. Um, also on the line from Able Solutions, Nicole Vesser, um, uh, also a, a virtual technical evangelist for Nintex. So she's on the Able Solutions team and is, um, uh, is an expert in Nintex and also Jason Barnes uh, who is a, a Nintex um, uh, professional, uh, so we appreciate them being here today. Um, and with that, um, I'm again, I'm not going to take up too much more of the time. I know we all want to jump right into the workshop, um, so I'm going to turn it over to Brad. I think is that who I'm handing the baton to? I'm uh, sure. I mean, unless you want to do any more introduction pieces on on anything here. No, I think that's it. Okay, Jordan perfect. <laughs> uh, then in that case, I'll just jump in and say, hi, I'm Brad Orlock. I'm one of the strategic alliances managers here at Intex. I've uh, been here for about six and a half years, uh, was actually on the technical side of the house of the sales organization and joined from an Intex uh, customer. So I was at a Fortune 500 enterprise customer that was leveraging Intex across eight different global business units and uh, just you know fell in love with the technology. So very passionate about the technology and uh, very passionate about the partnerships that we have. And, and I think that the team at ABLE has you know, done amazing things. I've seen Nicole's work firsthand and I can tell you that the challenges that you know her and the team have solved are absolutely lights out. So anyway, that's, uh, that's a little bit about myself. Matt, if you wanna say hello, cause you're the, you're the real ringleader of the show today. <laughs> uh, good morning, Matt Spears. Uh, pretty much, uh, I do everything uh, ProMap related uh, here at Nintex. So I get to do things like this, work with uh, prospects, work with customers uh, as they're implementing the solution to try to bring some uh, intentionality to their process management strategy and uh, leverage all the benefits that come with that. So happy to be here today. Yeah, awesome. Brad, let me kind of jump in real quick. Um, of course. I forgot to mention, um, and Matt, you may be mentioning this uh, in a second, but uh, Matt, to all the participants, Matt um, sent out an email late yesterday afternoon um, in regards to the workshop today. Uh, it was titled um, a virtual workshop tomorrow, Nintex Pro Map. So um, while started, you'll have that information. David, I lost you. I'm not sure if I was the only one. Um, so if you, if you want to repeat that, that might be helpful. Sure. Um, so I was just saying, Matt uh, sent out. Can you can you guys hear me? Yep, you're good now. OK, yep. Matt sent out an email late yesterday afternoon with some workshop details. Um, it, please check to make sure you receive that if you did not. Uh, just send a private chat to Nicole Vesser in the meeting and we'll make sure that you get that. Awesome. Thank you, David. And it's worth pointing out the chat will be manned. So between the, you know, the four or five of us from the, uh, you know, Nintex and Able teams, we will be manning Q&A on the chat. So don't be shy. <laughs> go ahead, Brad. Do you want to go ahead and hit the next slide there, Matt? Awesome. And you know what? I'm going to go ahead and turn my video off. I figure just for saving a little bit of bandwidth, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and turn the video off for the rest of this, but we just want to say hi.
Okay. So real quick, I always like to just take everyone through our mission for, you know, our mission slide for two reasons. First of all, the mission of Vintex is improving the way that people work through process management and automation. You're here today to really get your, you know, your feet wet in the process management aspect of the Vintex platform. So prepare to be dazzled. Um, so again, I just want to reiterate that the mission of the company is really to just focus on this core area and really take it to the next level. And this is what really what differentiates us from our contemporaries in the marketplace is that, uh, you know, we are a world-class leader in this space. Um, to that end, a little bit of our pedigree. Um, number one, you know, according to Forrester, be obligatory, you know, had uh, feather in the hat around digital process automation and being one of their leaders. Um, we are, or at least were last year, so we'll see how uh, the end of this month uh, shakes out or next month uh, with Microsoft, but we were the number one Microsoft co-sell ISV, meaning we just, all of our cloud technology lives in Microsoft's Azure public cloud as a SaaS offering. So we have a great partnership with Microsoft and, um, and go to market together. And then lastly, we're a channel driven company. We don't do professional services. That's where Able comes in. So the Able team is able to, you know, take our technology and again, deliver value rapidly back to our clients directly through our programs as, as a channel partner. Go ahead, man. Oh, and it's also worth pointing out that last slide I always like to laugh is that particular slide uh, or this particular image makes me smile because this is a stock photo we bumped into that also happens to be the Microsoft Technology Center in New York City. So it actually looks, you're inside the MTC and you're looking at the New York Times building in the background. And why that's really interesting is because those tables and those chairs working on them the way those people are, those two young ladies, that's the most uncomfortable place to do work. <laughs> so don't go there to actually try and get work done in those seats. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so thank you, Matt. Uh, a little bit about the Nintex process platform. So this is the world in which we live. Again, we're going to drill into essentially, you know, the, the number one in the one, two, three that is Nintex. But again, this is really the way our technology landscape looks inside of our organization. It's lots of disparate uh, sources and, and places where, you know, content lives, where people are interacting and working across. And, and of course, naturally, there's process that supports all of this happening, right? So legacy systems, teams, you, you name it, right? What Nintex aims to do naturally is be the connective tissue in the center of that. So go ahead, Matt. What you'll see is, you know, again, we do this, as I mentioned, in a one, two, three punch. So when we think about the people processing content across our disparate systems, we want to go ahead and understand and map out and manage those processes because things like change and how we manage change, as well as, you know, just trying to, you know, look at a process for potential improvement, which automation is a you know definitely an improvement around process um, we want to make sure we have a good grasp of that up front the second piece as i mentioned is a popular destination of process improvement you know, initiatives is automation and nintex can do that in in several different ways so we essentially cover the entire spectrum of automation in the form of robotic process automation which is where we're replicating keystrokes and you know mouse clicks on you know the, the desktop itself this is kind of the low-hanging fruit of automation and the the way of how do we at least get it automated today quickly. But then we also do the workflow and, and that's really more transformative. That's e-forms, that's mobile, that's orchestration of process behind the scenes. So as we're working in systems of record, you know, things are automatically happening. So again, both ends of the spectrum, plus we attach document automation and e-signatures to it as well. So we have a great partnership with Adobe to incorporate their sign technology into the Nintex platform. And then lastly, if we think about mapping and managing process, if we think about, you know, automating process with those different technologies, chances are it's probably going to be worth measuring the output and the improvement on those processes. So we have our analytics capabilities. Plus, as kind of a little bit of a bonus, we have an extensibility framework under the covers. So if there's something that you need to integrate our technology with that we don't have an integration with today, there's a platform to make that happen. So as you can see, you know, again, managing a mapping process, automation and analytics and measurement. So it's really the whole domain of process. That's what we focus on. Go ahead, Matt. Just a real quick kind of broad stroke across the different industries that we focus in, you know, or focus on. Uh, really, the the call out is, and I'm not going to drain the slide. We we are highly applicable across industries. We also have a kind of a sister slide to this one. That's uh, the horizontal applicability of Nintex. Just think of Nintex as a set of functionality. <clears throat> excuse me. That again can really cover all of your bases as far as process is concerned, regardless of what industry you're in. When I came from oil and gas, we used it for safety and 
inspections for CapEx approvals. We used it for um, temporary contract workers and, uh, you know, in you know, managing their their LAN IDs. So really, we could do everything from an IT centric, you know, lens to procurement to everything in between. And we do this across industries. Go ahead, Matt. So when I say that we are very applicable across industries, as you can see, you know, I'd be remiss in my duties as a you know proper salesperson if I didn't do the NASCAR slide, right? Uh, but I can tell you that in my previous life here at Nintex as one of our solution architects, you know, I've been on site with a number of these clients, and you know, it's fascinating to see you know companies like Amazon use Nintex extensively for project uh, uh, portfolio management. Um, you know, companies that are in the retail space use us for um, managing their real estate holdings and their uh, portfolios of, of properties and leases. Um, New York City, for example, the uh, NYPD uses the technology to track gunfire discharges and memos that go between, you know, 30,000 employees across, you know, all their precincts. So, again, very applicable to lots of different uh, spaces. Um, healthcare, we, we do product onboarding in that space and reconciling data against master data management. So, again, it can really be uh, a wide swath of things, but the biggest thing that's in common with all of these logos that you see here is that process is how they do their business and managing those processes and automating them is how we help them. Go ahead, man. Um, so we do have this quick side and I just want to just say this with this is kind of the bonus round and, and the COVID piece of it. You know, these are the three biggest challenges that we've seen in the last, you know, three months or so is that access to legacy systems, digitization, you know, taking paper-based process and, and going digital with it. And then lastly, and probably most importantly for today, go ahead, Matt, is managing change in business continuity. So that's what we're going to focus on today because, again, understanding what a process is, the players, the costs, all the ancillary things that happen with a process, um, getting a good feel and, and getting your arms around that is a foundation for success for all of your relevant projects that come downstream from that. So that being said, I'm done with my spiel. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Mr. Matt Spears. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Brad. Uh, so we're going to uh, work through the, the rest of this agenda uh, in the remaining time that we have today. And, and I just want to give you an idea of what that's going to look like. So uh, we're going to uh, spend a few moments talking about the necessity of, of process management, uh, talking about some of the benefits of process management, how ProMap fits into that. Uh, and then we're going to take a quick look at the tool. So I'll just do a quick flyover, five minutes or so, uh, giving you an idea of uh, the layout and the, the navigation of the tool itself. And then we're going to come back and do a little bit of knowledge sharing uh, in sections three and four. So we're going to cover some basic uh, components of, uh, of processes as we uh, display and manage those uh, pieces of information in ProMap to essentially get familiar with terminology and so we're, we're all speaking the same language and then we're going to get into a little bit of the art of process writing uh, in section four and review some high level process writing techniques that are going to allow you to get the most out of not just ProMap but really any process writing exercise that you do uh, whether it's in our tool or some other tool and then at the end we will jump into the solution together and do a hands-on exercise uh, at the end of the workshop. So that's the rest of our agenda. We're going to have a break somewhere uh, around section four and five, just depending on uh, how quickly we move through it. And so I just want to remind everyone, if you have questions, please utilize the chat bar and leave your questions in the chat. Uh, Brad and the team from ABLE uh, will be man uh, manning the chat and we'll be able to respond to those questions. Uh, or bring them up to me and we can discuss them as a group further. So uh, without uh, any further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into the content here. And so I, I want to start before we uh, you know, go in and start looking at ProMap, which is the Nintex process management solution. Uh, I want to not assume that everyone thinks uh, you know, process management is as important uh, as we think it is. And so to, to help try to drive this point home, I'm, I'm going to draw on a couple of quotes uh, from people who uh, have uh, many more credentials than I do in the process management field uh, and have done much more study and, uh, and work in that area. And so the first quote is one you may have seen before. It's a fairly popular quote from W. Edwards Deming, who was the uh, famous industrial engineer who helped rebuild, uh, rebuild the Japan economy after World War II. 
Uh, and he has a quote where he says, if you can't describe what you're doing as a process, then you don't know what you're doing. Uh, and so I, I, I want you to think about that quote and apply it to, to your situation for a moment. If a client or a vendor or a partner of yours were to ask you, how do you deliver value uh, to your clients? How do you, how do you provide value as an organization? What does that look like sequentially? Would you be able to explain that? And if you think that you might struggle with that, then I, I might suggest to you that you don't have a familiarity with your processes. Uh, and that's something that uh, is going to be a necessity if you want to uh, improve those processes and eventually perfect what you do. And so that kind of takes us into the second quote uh, from the book, Lean Thinking where the authors in this book state, <clears throat> if the activity is required to deliver value, and really we could sort of put a period there, the activity is required to deliver value. If you're unsure coming into this session today as to what a process is, there's your definition. A process is the activities required to deliver value. And so they say, if that cannot be precisely identified, analyzed, and linked together, in other words, we might say, if the process is not documented, if it's not mapped, then the process cannot be challenged, improved, and eventually perfected. So if you are interested in things like digital transformation or operational excellence, or pick whatever buzzword you prefer, uh, if you are into improving the way that your business does what they do, it starts with process. Because whether you provide goods or services to your clients, you do that through a set of processes. and and how well you know those processes, how well you manage them, is going to greatly determine uh, how much improvement you can get out of them. And so uh, I just wanna start here uh, addressing the necessity of process management for any company who's interested in things like digital transformation or operational excellence. And so with that said, uh, let's talk a little bit about what ProMap is and how does that fit into uh, the, the process management strategy. So ProMap is the it's process management tool of choice for companies like Salesforce, Coca-Cola, Johnson & Johnson, companies looking to improve team culture, drive collaboration and innovation, and achieve operational excellence. Now, notice that it's not, you know, we're not really starting here by saying ProMap is a process mapping tool. Uh, it's a process documentation tool. Uh, it certainly is that. But at the end of the day, as we were discussing just a moment ago, it's really much more than that uh, because processes at a business should not be mapped just for the sake of being mapped. There should be some ultimate goal. And ideally, we want to uh, do things like improve team culture. We want to uh, drive collaboration around processes and innovation around process improvement, ultimately seeing those improved processes drive us to being the best business that we could be. So achieving that operational excellence. ProMap creates simple to understand processes that are kept relevant through ownership and governance and then made easily accessible to the people who need them most. If you are looking for a process management tool, whether you choose ProMap or something else, I cannot encourage you highly enough that you need to find something that's going to fit these three categories. It's gonna meet these three things. It has to create simple to understand processes, so processes that can be understood quickly by your users. So it has to package the information in a simple way. You have to have some form of governance and accountability built into the solution, or else the processes go out of date and become irrelevant. And then thirdly, you have to have the ability to make those processes accessible to the people that need them. So when you're looking for a process management solution, I would encourage you to think about those three categories uh, as you're looking for those types of solutions for your business. So finally, uh, ProMap is the process platform that teams love to use. So that's a little bit about ProMap, how it fits into that process management strategy. Uh, now, why, uh, why do companies use ProMap? What are some of those benefits? And this is going to be a little bit of a repeat from what Brad was saying, but I think it bears repeating considering the time that we're in. Um, so some high-level benefits of ProMap. This is not exhaustive. These are just a few I want to, to zero in on. Um, using ProMap to achieve your process management goals, it helps improve the employee work experience. Uh, think about this. If your employees are coming into work right now and they have a question about what they do. They run into a roadblock and they're not sure what to do. Where do they go to get clarification? 
do they have to search SharePoint, uh, you know, endlessly and look through uh, dozens of search results that are not relevant to what they're looking for? Uh, do they have to go and ask their neighbor uh, and say, you know, hey, can you help clarify for me what I'm supposed to do in this situation? Um, do they just figure it out by trial and error? If those are the answers that that honestly you would say about your employees and your business, that creates um, really a, a little bit of a disengaged employee that become a little bit resentful towards the company because they're not getting the information they need to be successful. Uh, ProMap puts all of those uh, core processes in a single place that can be accessed easily and searched easily so that the answers can be uh, discovered by those end users very quickly. So that improves their employee work experience. It makes them happier coming into work because their job becomes easier. As a result, it lifts team engagement and culture. People start talking about process where before that uh, was you know, quite uh, quite honestly is, is not normally a part of a business conversation. Uh, ProMap helps normalize that. Um, and also as a result, because people are operating off of the same playbook, off of an up-to-date standard, it normalizes that customer experience. So the customer starts to receive consistent benefits from the business, and that's great for those long-term relationships. And then finally, this last point, and this is a repetition from what Brad was saying, uh, I can't think of a time in my life when this has been more relevant than right now. And that's uh, you know, the fact that process management supports business continuity. Um, let's be honest, uh, the companies that went into this COVID-19 uh, situation with good process standards that were governed and kept up to date and put in the hands of the people that needed them, those individuals and those companies are operating at an advantage over companies who were not prepared. And so uh, if we want to be prepared for that next thing that's coming, so whatever the next thing is after this, we need to build in uh, good, robust standard processes that are governed and made accessible to the people who need them. So that when we're working remotely, when we're operating on a, a smaller staff, when people are cross training and doing things that they've never done before, that they have all the information necessary to be successful. So with that, we're gonna get into a quick high level look at ProMap before we uh, move on. All right. So what we're looking at here is the home screen for ProMap. It's a cloud-based solution. Um, so your, your organization uh, would have a unique uh, ProMap site uh, that would look very similar to this. The background of the pictures and things are going to be different, uh, but the general layout is going to be the same. All of your users would log into ProMap with a username or password or single sign-on. And what's going to happen is that they're going to see very quickly information that's relevant to them. And so you can see I'm logged into ProMap as a junior accountant, and that's going to point me to specific pieces of information. So I can see that there are 13 processes that I'm in. So essentially ProMap's looking across all of the processes built into this site, and it's looking for junior accountant as a performer, and it's giving me a quick link to those right here on my homepage. I can see any process ownership uh, responsibilities that I happen to have. So if I'm authoring a process or managing a process for the company, I see those here. I also see any notifications relevant to me. So are there processes or documents that have changed recently that I need to look at that impact my job? Have there been new processes that have been added to the system that I should check out? And what are those specific process ownership actions that I need to take? I can see all of those and more right here from the home screen. I can also see a little bit of my personal process and document browsing history. So what are those processes and documents that I've been looking at recently? Uh, and then as I go across the site and I find processes and documents that are helpful to me, I can pin those to my homepage. Really thinking about those kind of three you know, critical functions and features of a process management tool that we were talking about. So simplicity, governance and accountability, and then accessibility. This is about accessibility. We want to make relevant process information easily accessible to the users in your business. Now, the majority of the time, users are going to just drive right to this search bar and start typing in keywords, looking for processes or process groups that are relevant to them. And so when they do that, ProMap is going to give uh, search results that are going to look for a match for that keyword. So I can see down here at the bottom, different process groups that are a match for that keyword search. And then at the top, different processes that are a match for that. And so if I find uh, the process that I'm looking for, I can simply click into that from this home page and navigate right to the process. 
Now, a quick uh, call out here, the distinction between processes and process groups. Um, processes live inside of process groups. So we're going to talk about the structure more in a moment, um, but just uh, for the time being, just know that every process lives inside of a group in ProMap. And so when I click into a process, this is that core view that I get. Now, if I navigate it to, you know, 20 other processes in ProMap, they're all going to have the same basic layout. So it helps drive consistency uh, and familiarity with your users so they can begin to anticipate where certain process information lives because each process is structured in the same way. And that again helps drive engagement. So I can see at the top here the process that I'm looking at. I can see on the left hand side in this black vertical column the process and any other processes that live inside of the same process group. And so I can see in this case, develop new products and services is the group. Here's our process that we're looking at, and it lives in that group along with these four other processes. Now, if I want to see, well, show me those all five of these processes at a high level and how they relate to one another. So in other words, an end-to-end -end view or a value stream view, I could click into this group and see that. So if I back out, take a step back and look at develop new products and services from a high level, what I'm going to see is a high level flow of each of those processes showing the relationship and the handoffs as the process progresses. Okay, and now I can drill back down here into the detail of the particular process that we were just looking at. Um, sorry, I saw, thought I saw a chat item come in. Doesn't look like there's anything new. Um, so when we get here, we're going to look at some of these components in more detail uh, here in a few moments, but a couple of things I want to point out. The prominence of governance. So as I drag this summary bar up, you're going to see that every process has an owner and an expert. These are the individuals at the business that are tasked with building and then managing the process on behalf of the company. I can see as a user very clearly what the objective of the process is, when the next review date is, so I can have confidence that this process is up to date and I'm looking at an approved version. Um, and if I have questions or feedback for improvement, I know who to send it to, right? I can go up to the top here in this feedback tab and I can leave either positive feedback, I can suggest an improvement, or maybe I have a question, I'm gen uh, genuinely confused about something and I want clarification. I can leave those feedback items here in the process. ProMap's going to notify the owner and the expert and then they will respond through ProMap and ProMap facilitates those notifications back and forth. So that's one of the ways that we would support continuous improvement is through allowing end users to leave those suggestions as they're consuming the information. Uh, now the core view here in the center, uh, there are two basic components, uh, two basic uh, categories of components anyway. Uh, one is going to be process boundaries. This is something we're really going to spend some time on when we get into the techniques section. But you can see here that triggers and inputs is really the starting point for this process. So uh, what starts the process? What are those things I need to perform it? Those would be our triggers and inputs. And then at the back end, we have an ending point here, which is a link to another process. So I can see this is where we start. This is where we end. Everything between those two points is the process. So these are the activities that are creating value uh, around defining the product concept. Uh, and the way that we organize that are going to be activities, which are high level descriptions in these boxes that are organized in horizontal swim lanes assigned to roles or responsibilities. When I click into those activities, I can see granular level or task level detail. So this is explaining to the user more in depth. How do you actually go about doing this work? We can attach relevant documents or, or supplemental information. Uh, we can apply system tags, uh, we can identify opportunities for improvement, we can call out time and cost metrics, um, so you can get very detailed in what you're capturing here at the process level. Um, so this is uh, a process in ProMap, and we're going to, again, spend more time in this together here in a little bit, but I wanted to give you a look as to how do we get you know, into the site, what's the priority in terms of information that the user sees, and then how do they gain access to the process content that lives in the site? Once they get into the process, how do they decipher what the process contains? So what are those core components? How do I know the governance uh, that exists in the process? So on and so forth. So that's a quick high level look uh, at ProMap. If you have questions about that, 
please feel free to uh, utilize the chat bar and ask those. Uh, and we will continue here to move along into our process editing basics uh, discussion. So I'm just going to pause here and just make sure that there are no outstanding questions for just a moment before we move on. All right. So what are we wanting to do here when we talk about process editing um, and the basics of process editing? Well, really, there are two things I want to do. One is I want to uh, draw some distinction between four different terms that um, are important in ProMap when we start talking about how to build a process and process management. But also, even outside of ProMap, these are terms that I see quite often companies confusing with one another. And it really makes having conversation around processes hard. And so those would be policy, process, procedure, and work instructions. How do we draw distinctions between those terms? And then how are those terms utilized in ProMap? So we're going to look at that. Uh, and then the second thing we're going to do is familiarize, familiarize ourselves with the layout of process components in ProMap. So we're really going to spend some time defining those things that we just took a high level flyover and looked at. So things like triggers and inputs, outputs and targets, activities, tasks, uh, so on and so forth. We're going to look at those in a little bit more depth. So starting off with <clears throat> the definition of these four core terms, policy, process, procedure, and work instruction. So when we talk about a policy in ProMap, what we're referring to is an overarching company rule that governs <clears throat> at least a single process, but it may govern multiple processes. So uh, it's important to note here, policies do not tell us how to do anything. They don't give us how-to instructions. They typically tell us what we can, uh, what we cannot do and what we must do. So that's where a policy fits in. It sets the guardrails, the rules of engagement for that process. The process lives <clears throat> underneath the authority of the policy and it depicts in an end-to-end -end view how we take inputs <clears throat> and transform them into outputs. So what are those steps? Uh, who are the roles that are involved? Where are the handoffs? So on and so forth. That's a process. Next would be procedure. So procedure is the lower level sequence of tasks that live inside of an activity. So this is where we actually get down to uh, what may be commonly referred to as desktop procedures. So uh, how do we actually go about performing that particular activity? That would be where we utilize tasks in ProMap. And then further down in granularity would be work instructions. Work instruction documents supplement task level information. These can be uh, forms, guides, uh, training videos, could be uh, web links uh, to different uh, sites or applications, anything that's going to supplement the instructions that we're giving the user at the task level. So let me give you an example of, of how this would look in a process. So let's imagine that we had a policy for uh, our company vehicles that stated all company vehicles must be kept roadworthy at all times. Again, there's a must statement. Doesn't tell us how to do it, doesn't tell us what processes live under that. It just sets the rules of engagement. Let's imagine there's a process underneath that policy called booking a company pool car. And that process is made up of four different steps. Within step four, uh, we can look at the procedure for how to pick up the keys on the day of travel. So there are three tasks associated with that. One is we pick the keys up. Second, we do a safety check and then we depart in the car. Well, if we look under task B, we see that there's a pre-drive checklist because uh, it's one thing to state, hey, do a safety check. It's another thing to actually do the safety check. So if we were to open that guide, we would see that there's a very detailed list that needs to be uh, examined before we could say confidently that we had completed task B. Now, it doesn't make sense to try to type out this entire pre-drive checklist in our procedure. And so because it's so granular in detail, it's more practical, it keeps our processes simpler, it, it makes them easier to understand when we simply attach that as a supplemental document, as a work instruction, and then link it at the appropriate point in the process. Uh, and there's a question uh, in, in chat before we move on. Jason's asking, does the tool support <coughs> management of processes that are contained within an 
uh, ERP system, uh, such as Oracle eBusiness Suite. Um, so Jason, I'm not exactly sure uh, what the question is. There, you can you can certainly document the processes that need to be performed within or Oracle. Um, so whatever those core processes are that happen in your ERP, you could document those in ProMap. Uh, that would serve as the work instructions for uh, your end users as they went into the ERP to engage with that system to do their work. Uh, and then you could link out to that location from ProMap. Uh, so you could make ProMap essentially an access point into Oracle uh, if you wanted to do that as well. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question. If not, uh, please feel free to uh, clarify. All right, so this is how we would structure in ProMap policy, process, procedure, and work instructions. Now, with that in mind, I want to give you an idea of uh, the way that we view a process. Now, this is something that, again, is ProMap, ag it's tool agnostic, okay? So it's not uh, unique to ProMap, although the design of ProMap is specific to uh, allow for this type of categorization that we're going to, to cover here. But I think this is relevant even if you're mapping your processes on a whiteboard or with sticky notes on butcher paper. Uh, these are relevant uh, topics for, for you. Uh, so when you think about a process, there are really two parts of a process. The first part would be what we would consider process boundary information. The second part would be process detail information. And it's important that when you go to map a process that you start by defining the process boundary information. This is going to establish our starting and ending points, and it's going to uh, really help us prevent process scope creep. So I'm not sure how many of you have, have encountered this, but if you've mapped processes before, you, you have certainly had this happen, where you sit down and you start mapping a process, and all of a sudden you've got 100 steps or 50 steps, uh, you've got uh, this process that's much larger than you anticipated. Uh, that's called process scope creep. And that typically happens when we don't define our boundaries really well. And so what are those boundary items that we need to be defining at the beginning of a process engagement? First would be triggers uh, and inputs. Think of these as our first fence post. And we looked at that in ProMap where we saw, really quickly I'll jump back here, where we saw Triggers and inputs is the beginning of our process. So this is really our fence post, our first fence post of the process. And then on the back end, we would have outputs and targets or uh, an option, in, as you can see here, linking to a sub process, but this would still be the output of this work here. And so we wanna follow that structure when we talk about boundary information. So you have triggers and inputs on the front end, outputs and targets on the back end. Now, what are the, these different components? Triggers are the situation or the signal that causes us to start the process. Inputs are those things that we need to actually begin the process. So let me give you an example that will hopefully help you draw some distinction between triggers and inputs. So let's imagine we have a process for uh, you know, uh, paying vendor invoices. Okay, so that process, paying vendor invoices, is triggered by a calendar start date. So it's something that we do once a month and let's say we do it on the first of every month. So every time a, the first of a new month starts, that process begins. However, the inputs, so what are the things we need to do that process? We actually need the vendor invoices. So regardless of whether it's the first of the month or not, if we have no vendor invoices, we cannot perform that process because we're missing a necessary prerequisite component. Um, so that would be a distinction between triggers and inputs, both of them happening on the front end of a process. On the back end, we have outputs and targets. And so outputs help us define what we've created by completing the process. And then performance targets uh, identify those key metrics uh, or success metrics that would indicate whether a process is performing as designed or not. Okay, so uh, outputs and targets on the back end, triggers and inputs on the front end. Once those two points are established, we can safely build out the content that exists between those two points. Now there's a question that we would wanna ask around uh, inputs and outputs specifically, and that would be, <clears throat> what are the dependent processes related to that? So for inputs, who's creating those inputs and giving them to me? So is there a process upstream that's giving those to me that I'm using as inputs for my process? And then uh, the same question at the back end. 
So when I've created this, am I giving these outputs to another process? And if so, how are they using it? That helps us define value streams in ProMap. So it keeps us from uh, you know, really focusing on uh, single processes in a siloed way and helps us think outside of individual processes and start to tie those things together at a higher level. Uh, questions or, or comments about the boundaries? All right, so uh, once we move beyond the boundary information, so when we have those triggers and inputs, outputs and targets defined, we would want to uh, start to build the process uh, that exists between those two points. So in ProMap, those are going to be made up uh, primarily of activity. Now we looked at activities already in ProMap, but these are the high level steps in the process. They're represented by these boxes with the blue headers. Uh, and they're numbered 1.0 through however many exist in the process. Within the activity, we would have task level detail. Tasks explain how to perform each of those activities, so A through D or however many tasks are necessary. We already talked about work instruction documents as being a supplement to these tasks, but there's also another uh, critical um, component that's going to help us supplement the task level information, and those are going to be called notes. So in ProMap, notes are going to be critical for capturing those what-if scenarios. So think about maybe traditional process mapping methods. Um, what do you do when there is a what-if scenario? So let's imagine something is uh, up for approval, right? Something needs to be approved. Uh, how do we typically map that in a process? You know, if you're using Visio or something like that or doing it on a whiteboard or sticky notes, you're probably doing some sort of a decision diamond. Is it approved? If yes, go this way. If no, loop back, right? Well, those types of loop back scenarios, um, quite honestly, can bring complexity, unnecessary complexity into a process design. And they can also distort the true flow of the process. We'll look at that uh, more in detail when we get into the techniques section. But in ProMap, we really want to focus in on simplicity, presenting process information in a way that's easy to understand. And so that means that we would want to eliminate as many of those decision diamonds as we can from the face of the map and then address those exceptions at the task level using notes. So essentially questions and answers. So the notes allow us to pose the question and give a clear, straightforward answer. Uh, and if necessary, link to a sub process that's relevant uh, to the answer to that question. OK, uh, again, we're going to get into expositing how to use notes uh, in more detail in the technique section, but just know that's going to be a critical part of our process details. Uh, but that's a process, essentially, your boundaries and your details. If you have those two components defined, you have a process. So when you sit down to map a process, again, whether it be in ProMap or any other tool, uh, you want to start by asking the right questions. And up front, those are going to be these five questions. Uh, that relate to our boundary information. Who's the audience? What's the name of the process? What's the objective of the process? What's the starting point? So triggers and inputs. And then when I'm done, what have I created? What's my ending point? What are those outputs that I've produced? Now I, that I have this clearly defined, my scope clearly defined in the boundary section, I can start to build the details. What are the activities and tasks? what roles are performing the, those tasks and activities, and then are there any known exceptions or variations? So what are those what if scenarios in the process? Um, if you have this information, again, you have a process. Uh, so when we move into uh, ProMap structure and governance, so how does that process fit into the overall structure of information in ProMap? As we mentioned, that process would live in a process group. And we kind of glossed over it uh, just a second ago, but every process has a clear process title. Now that title is going to be important to our group structure because it helps us categorize process information, helps make it easy to find through search. And if we start that process name with a verb, it gets our users thinking about action. It gets them thinking about actually doing process work. Every process also has governance built in, so there's owners and experts. Uh, how you use those roles can vary, um, but th this is typically what we would see uh, organizations using those roles for in ProMap. All right, so as a, as a wrap up here, the basic components of a process look like this. 
Uh, every process has boundary information made up of triggers and inputs, and then outputs and targets. So these are our fence posts. Uh, between those two points, you have activities. Those activities live in swim lanes that uh, define who's responsible for performing the work. Within each activity, there is task level detail, so our how-to instructions. Um, those are supplemented with uh, work instruction documents or uh, notes to capture those key or common exceptions or variations that come up when performing that process. So if you're familiar in some sense with these terms, you're going to be able to uh, jump into ProMap and probably start creating content uh, fairly quickly. All right, questions on this before we move on? All right, so one thing I want to do is jump into ProMap really quickly and just uh, model for you how we would build out uh, a process. So this is gonna be something that um, I'm just going to do as sort of a test for us before we get into our techniques section. I wanna show you how simple it is to get started. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going into my test group here <coughs> in my demo environment. And I'm going to right click in this group because I wanna add a new process to this group and I'm going to say, create a process. And so when I do that, I'm going to have to build in some of this boundary information that we were just talking about. So what's the name of the process? And let's just do one uh, for filling the car with gas. It's a simple enough process. And I'm going to assign Richard as the owner. I'm going to assign Ivan as the expert. And then I'm going to define our objective. So what are we trying to achieve as filling uh, or running out? All right, let's not get too complicated here. So with that information, I can begin to create a process in ProMap. And so when I do that, it's going to add a fill car with gas underneath this test group process. So it's gonna follow that structure that I just uh, assigned to it. And it's going to prompt me to begin building out <clears throat> the procedure of that process. So what are the activities and tasks? And what we already talked about, we want to define our triggers and inputs and outputs and targets first. So if we're doing a process, uh, and we'll do this for our exercise, uh, or if you were doing a process for your business, definitely jump in, define your triggers and inputs first, define your outputs and targets next. Uh, for the sake of our ex quick example here, I'm just gonna jump right into building this uh, process details. And so to do that, I'm gonna start to add activities. Now remember, activities are those high level descriptions of what is happening. So uh, for this process, filling a car with gas, our first activity, that high level step that happens is driving to the gas station. And I'm going to assign that to a particular role and responsibility, in this case, the driver. So I have a, a high level process step and I have a role that's performing it. I'm going to add our second activity in this case would be pull up to the pump. The driver is going to do that as well. I'm going to add a third activity for fill. Let's actually put the gas into the car. And I'm going to assign this to uh, the passenger. So we're going to have the driver uh, stay in the car for this. And then we'll add our fourth activity, which is driving home. Now, again, this is my interpretation of filling a car with gas at a high level but I want to give you the idea of how simple it is to create a process flow in the tool. So with just these few pieces of information, I can begin to have a process map created for me. And this is another uh, you know, key differentiator with ProMap is that it's going to do the mapping of the process automatically for you based on what you build into this outline editor. So as I press save, what's going to happen is the tool is mapping this for me. So all I need to do is jump back over here to this process map tab, and I can see the process map that was created. So here's our summary information. Ivan and Richard are the, the governance. I see our objective down here, and I see the process flow. Two swim lanes for two different roles, driving to the gas station all the way to driving home. Now, when I click into these different activities, there's no task level detail yet, because if you remember, we didn't build any of this out. And so what I'm going to do is jump into the edit tab here, and I'm going to build out some task level detail for filling the car with gas. So the first thing I'm going to say here is open the gas cap, um, pay with credit card, select fuel grade. And 
and replace the nozzle. Now, uh, we mentioned notes when we were talking about those different components. And notes are used to capture common exceptions uh, and variations. Well, any time that we have those, uh, we would be tempted traditionally to build in a decision diamond. Um, and again, that builds in unnecessary complexity into our map. And so to avoid that, we want to use a note. And here's an example of where a common exception in this process might occur. Pay with a credit card. Well, what if I don't have a credit card? How do I pay? So instead of trying to build in some complicated decision diamond and have you know, loopbacks and alternate paths on our process map, just provide a simple, straightforward answer to that question right here where it matters. So let's add a note and let's pose the question. What if I am paying with cash? Question mark. Answer. All right, whatever that answer is, go inside and pay the attendant, tell them what pump you're on, give them the cash, go back and you know finish the process, right? Whatever the answer is, we can build in that detail here. And if for some reason that answer was extremely complex or it led us down an alternate path altogether, we could add a process link, which means we could actually point the user to a separate process altogether uh, if we wanted to. So you have options here with this note. Uh, my point being that this is a very... Uh, you get a lot of mileage out of this. Uh, it's something that is going to uh, replace almost all of those traditional decision, di decision diamonds in your process maps. All right, so I'm going to save that and we'll take one quick look at the result. So jumping back to the process map, we see 3.0 here. I'm going to click into that. There's our detail. We see our instructions. We open the gas cap. We pay with the credit card. Well, what if I'm not paying with uh, the credit card, but I'm using cash? I can expand that and get the answer. Uh, here's another benefit of a note. If this question is not relevant to me, I don't have to look at the answer. I can skip right over it. Okay, you're giving the end user control over when they get detail, which is helpful. So that we can see that here's our answer, and then we continue on with that step. So hopefully that gives you a quick idea of how to build process information into ProMap. Um, you do it in this outline editor. You don't spend your time, your precious time, drawing a process map. The system will do that for you automatically. You simply go right to this editor and build in the process details. Let ProMap do the hard work of organizing this into a flowchart for you. Okay, um, so questions about how this works, anything like that, please feel free to uh, drop those into the chat bar and we will address them for you. All right. So if there are no questions, what we're going to move into next is our process writing techniques section. And so we're going to go through these techniques. We'll take a quick break and we'll come back and we will do our exercise uh, together as a group. So our objectives around process writing techniques is to create engaging, easy to understand processes and procedures. Question for you. Why do we care about creating engaging processes? Why does it matter? And the answer is not very complicated, okay? We want people to use our processes. If your processes are not engaging, uh, you know, it's, this is not, uh, not something that you all are unaware of, <clears throat> but if a process is not engaging, people will not use it. If people do not use it, then the business doesn't get the benefit of actually having the process in the first place. And so then we would have to ask the question, why are we even doing this? Um, here's an example. If you have processes that look like this, although they may be accurate, I would argue that the usability of this process and how, how hard it is to decipher what's happening here is a barrier that keeps people from benefiting from the information that may be contained in the process. <clears throat> in other words, the uh, presentation of this process compromises the content of the process. That's not something we want to see happen in our business. Now, some organizations don't have process maps at all. They just have a bunch of these text-based procedures. And maybe this is your business. Maybe this is how you uh, instruct users uh, as to how to do their jobs. Uh, the text-based procedures, at least for my money, are a little bit better, but they still are not good enough because let's imagine that all I need is this one bullet point here to do my, to do my part of the process. I'm forced to read through all of this document just to find that single bullet point. And so I've ended up wasting time looking through information that's not relevant for me 
just to find that one line that I need to do my job well. And so we need to do better than this. We have to present this information in a way that's easier to understand, that's easier to engage with. Uh, here's another example uh, of a process that, again, it may be perfectly accurate. There may be wonderful information in here, but I'll just be honest with you, I'll never know because I'm not going to spend the time to look through it. I'm not going to try to read that, especially when I have, um, I, I'm a day-to-day -day frontline employee. I've got enough pressures as it is to get my job done. I'm not going to sit back and waste time trying to read this information. So what we want to do with ProMap in creating engaging processes is we wanna take this document and we wanna transform it into something that can be easily understood in you know, 15 to 20 seconds and allow the user to identify where in that process they want more information and then allow them to drill down and go get it, okay? So it's not about compromising the actual flow of the process. We don't want you to, uh, you know, to compromise on how the process actually occurs. What we want you to do is to rethink how you present that information, how you package that information and give it to your end users. And so we think that by following some of these techniques, you'll be able to take a process that's very complex and distill it down to something that can be uh, followed quite simply. Uh, so a few things to keep in mind before we look at those techniques. Uh, when you create engaging processes, you wanna know your audience. You, you do want to think about building a process that a beginner could use. <clears throat> Again, there's a fine line here. Uh, you don't want to build processes for people who are totally unfamiliar with your business. Uh, who've never uh, logged into a computer before. If you're if you work in a, a white collar industry, you don't want to build a process um, explaining to someone how to turn on a computer, um, right? That that that's a waste of a time. That's kind of that's kind of going off uh, too far off of the other end, uh, trying to cater towards beginners. Um, but you can find that nice middle ground. Uh, so as you're building a process, make sure you're sending it to other people for feedback. Uh, you're making sure that there's a consensus that the process is accurate and that it's easy to use before you put it out into the business for consumption. And then uh, that last point is pretty critical here. You're not trying to build a perfect process. You want a really good process, but you don't want a perfect process before you publish it to the business. Uh, because as we looked at already in ProMap, there is this feedback component where end users can engage with processes and provide suggestions for improvement to the owners and experts. That's how we pursue perfection in ProMap is through feedback, not by going into some sterile laboratory type environment and creating a perfect process and then pushing it out to the business. All right, so it's just a different methodology. Uh, it may require a little bit of uh, you know, change of thought from uh, perhaps some traditional uh, mapping uh, methodologies that you may have used in the past, but we think that you can get a lot of mileage out of those for your business. All right, so with that being said, let's get into those techniques. So I'm gonna let you just kind of look through these for a second while I uh, take a sip of my coffee here and uh, refresh that. Then we'll look into the, the definitions of each of these. All right, so these are our, our six uh, techniques. The first one is the 80-20 rule. You may have heard of this before. This is also called the happy path rule or the happy flow uh, rule. This is where we look to map what happens 80% of the time and then address the 20% exceptions in an appropriate way. So basically let's get those exceptions off of the map because they're not, they don't happen the majority of the time. So let's not act like they do, okay? Uh, keeping the main thing, the main thing. That's what the 80-20 rule is all about. Uh, next is distinguishing between tasks and activities. If you're a heavy Visio user or Lucidchart or you love to map processes on a sticky on sticky notes uh, or a whiteboard, this may be an issue that you have run into. Uh, because you don't have the ability in some of those tools to layer detail, like where we've already mentioned in ProMap, where we have an activity, and then within the activity, we have tasks. What happens is that because tools oftentimes don't provide this level of, of depth for their users, people end up mapping tasks on the face of the workflow with the activities. 
So you'll have something like fill car with gas, and then that moves to open a gas cap uh, and replace the nozzle, and then that moves to drive home. So you have these 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 huge variations in level of detail on the process map itself. Um, and so that's where this next uh, technique comes in, where we want to group those tasks together and then establish them underneath a governing activity. Um, next, we want to deal with exceptions and variations appropriately. We already mentioned notes are going to be a key uh, method that we're going to use to do that, but there are, all, are also some other ways that we are going to deal with those. Next, we're going to use the verb first rule, uh, which is the easiest rule on this list. Um, make sure you start your process names, your activity names, and your task statements with verbs, pointing people to action. Uh, next, we want to chunk large processes down into smaller processes so that they're easier to consume. Um, instead of having a 50-step process, have five 10-step processes and link those together at a high level and allow the user to drill down and get detail where they want detail. Again, don't force them to read through a 50-step process. Give them five 10-step processes to choose from. It allows them to consume and understand that information faster and easier. And then next, we want to use multimedia where appropriate. That essentially means wherever we can use pictures and videos, we want to use pictures and videos to help supplement our words. All right, let's look at those rules in action. Uh, here's an example process for making coffee, and let's apply the 80-20 rule to this process. The 80-20 rule again says, identify the 20% exceptions and remove them from the face of the map and deal with them in an appropriate way. Now, how do we identify the exceptions, those 20% exceptions on this map? And it's a very simple visual cue. And this is the same for this process, just as it is for any process that you have mapped in your business right now. If you have a decision diamond on a process map, that is an exception because there are more than one, you know, there's more than one thing that could happen out uh, off of that decision diamond. And so uh, in this case, we, we see that we have three different decision diamonds or three exceptions. And so what we would want to do is look at them and identify, are they the majority? So do those exceptions happen eight out of 10 times or are they more like two out of 10? And then that determines what we should do with them. So let's look at our first one here. Uh, do we have enough cups? If we do not, we need to wash cups and then continue with the process. Secondly, is the milk expired? If the milk is expired, we need to buy more milk and then continue on with the process. And then the third exception, are we serving any diabetics? If we are, we use the appropriate sweetener and we continue on with the process. So these three exceptions, I think if we were to um, take a poll, we would probably see that they are all 20% exceptions. So they're, they're not the majority of the time. In other words, the majority of the time, we do have enough cups, the milk is not expired, and we're not serving diabetics. If that's the case, let's move, remove those from the face of the map and clean up our process. Now we're not deleting them, we're not taking them out of the process. We're simply setting them to the side and we'll deal with them here in a moment. So let's just set them to the side and see what our process flow looks like right now. Now it's much simpler. We can see we have a much more straightforward process. Well, that leads us to our next technique, which is grouping tasks underneath activities. So look at the process and ask yourself, based on the definitions that we were covering earlier in the, in the, in the workshop today, what, uh, what are activities and what are tasks and how many of those do you see on this map? How many activities do you see? And I'll give you a hint, the answer is not seven. Um, just because there are seven boxes doesn't mean there are seven activities. And I would submit to you that there are really only three activities. The first one is going to be taking orders. That's a high level description of what is happening. The second activity is all of these boxes combined. Because if we look at this, these are really task level details. These are granular level instructions. Get the cups out, add the coffee, add the milk, add the water. We could combine all of this under a single activity and call that activity something like make the drink, okay? And then that leads to our third activity, which is serving the drink. So if we apply this rule and build this process into ProMap, we would have something that looks like this, where we're taking the order from the customer, making the drink, and serving the drink. Now, that leads us back to what we started with, all of those decision diamonds. How do we deal with those? Where did those go? Well, we need to deal with them appropriately um, and chiefly, we're going to use notes to do that. 
So how would that look in ProMap? So we have our three-step process. Our second step contains all of the task level detail that we just combined into it. And that's where one of those decisions existed, which was, is the milk expired? And so instead of having that as a diamond on the map and having an alternate path of logic, if that were to happen, let's just build that in as a note, ask the question, and give a very straightforward answer as to what to do if that's the case. Okay, it makes the process simpler to understand. It reduces the clutter on the map. And I would argue that presenting it this way is much more helpful for your end user than giving them something like this. Okay, and think about your business processes that exist within your organization. Do you think that you would get uh, a higher level of engagement if you package that information in this type of format versus maybe a traditional process mapping type of a format? All right, let's continue on here. So uh, this is the, the first and primary way that we will deal with exceptions is using notes. However, there are other ways that we can deal with exceptions in ProMap. There are three other ways. Uh, the next way would be to use if statements. So if statements allow us to make a decision part of the normal process flow, but put a condition to that step. Here's an example. Uh, let's, let's imagine that the process uh, was making coffee and the decision was, is milk required? Question mark. If yes, add milk. If no, skip the add milk and go to the next step, right? You can imagine it would be mapped, something like that. Well, what we could do is just make that uh, decision part of the normal flow of the process, just putting a comma if required at the end of it. And that is a visual cue for your user that this step is not necessarily required. Um, and then you could give additional detail in the procedure using a note to explain when that uh, condition would actually occur. You can also use the if requested technique in the task level. Uh, and then you can get very rich and meaningful at the activity level with what that condition is. So instead of perform credit check if required, actually explain when it would be required. Perform credit check if a new customer. Just uh, that, that would allow you to eliminate any note within the procedure because you've already explained what that condition is uh, on the map itself. So those are if statements. That's the second way that we deal with exceptions and variations. The third way would be parallel activities. This is essentially, uh, you know, choose your own adventure here. Uh, are you building up, uh, you know, a, a, a drink with tea or with coffee? And the user can determine which step they go into based on the request that happened uh, upstream from their customer. The fourth way if you find that you have too many notes, if you have too many if statements, too many parallel activities, you can always build in separate individual processes for those conditions, okay? That's always an option in ProMap. If you want to do that, there is a way uh, through a, a, a feature that we call process variant management that would allow you to bundle those underneath a common process. And so it just makes managing those easier than having three separate processes. You could have three unique processes, but they would all be connected underneath a governing standard. I'm not going to get into this in much more detail today, uh, but just know that that exists. So that leads us into our next technique, which is the verb first rule. So looking at this process, is it easy to understand? Do you understand what's going on here? And the answer is probably not, because uh, we're just not giving you enough detail. So notice that there are no verbs in these activity names. Therefore, there's a lot of ambiguity as to, you know, for me as the user, what's happening here. I can fix that by applying a verb to the front of each of these activities. So instead of just saying sales orders, how about enter sales orders? All of a sudden the light comes on, right? It's much more clear as to what's happening here just by adding a simple word at the beginning of that activity. Now you can go into more depth here if you want. So instead of entering sales orders, you could just say enter sales orders in Salesforce. You could get very rich and meaningful. You don't have to do this, but again, this is something that uh, allows you to just create process content that's more engaging, that's easier to understand. Again, it's all about know knowing your audience and building processes that are going to resonate with them. All right, our next technique is where we take a process that is a little bit longer and we break it down into multiple sub-processes to speed up the comprehension. Now, that's typically going to be any process that's over 10 steps. 
we want to think about breaking that into multiple components. Um, now, the example we see here is 11 steps. It, it, is this process overly complex? I don't think it is. Um, so if you have 11 steps, it's not the end of the world. You don't have to break that up into multiple processes. But if you had a process that was 25 steps, I think we have an issue because a 25 step process, uh, I can't read in 10 or 15 seconds and understand clearly what's happening. And so at, at, that, at that type of length, we're really introducing a burden that doesn't need to be there. Um, so we would want to apply this chunking technique. So let's look at this example for recruiting staff. Even though it's only 11 steps, we can still simplify it if we choose to. We could break this up into multiple pieces. So let's just identify, here's a component here. Uh, these next few steps are a separate process, so on and so forth. And if we did that in ProMap, we might end up with a high level process that looks like this. So that 11 step process is now chunked into four uh, high level sub processes. And as a user, I could drill into, let's say, advertise position, and I would see something that looks like this, where there is a four step process, and the input to that is obtaining the approval to recruit, and the output is selecting the candidate. And that's consistent with our high level flow. Again, the idea here is to speed up comprehension and make it easier for your end users to engage with this content. Uh, a rule of thumb here is that we say an optimal process should have between three and 10 activities. Uh, if you have less than three activities, you're probably not looking at a process. You're probably looking at something that is a part of a, of, of a process, a smaller part of a process, but it's probably not standalone. If you have more than 10, you want to chunk that down because it's it's it can be easier to understand for your end users. All right, our last technique here using multimedia where appropriate. So in this example, I'm giving task instructions to resolve error messages, and I'm and instead of trying to type out in ProMap, okay, how do you resolve the error messages? I've just attached a guide here, and that guide contains very granular level instructions with screenshots. And so if I need a refresher on how to do that, I can click into that guide and I can see that. Or if I'm a new user and I want to train myself on how to do this, I'm probably going to be referencing this guide. So this is a way where we can supplement task level instructions with additional information. Uh, leveling this up, one would be using a video instead of uh, a static document with pictures. So do a screenshot, a screen capture of you actually performing the task level instructions in an ERP or something like that, uh, and then uploading that to the process map. So now the user has a you know, 20, 30 second training video built into the process that's relevant at the exact point in the process uh, that they're interested in. Um, this really makes ProMap into a great training tool. I would definitely encourage you to, to think about adding videos where possible. It really is a difference maker. All right, so those are our high level techniques. So hopefully uh, that makes sense to everyone. And any comments or questions, again, please uh, let, us, let us know, happy to engage with those. Otherwise, what we're going to do next is get into our exercise. We're going to take first a, a quick break uh, before we get into that. And um, as we're on the break, we're gonna give people a chance to get into the workshop environment. So if you would like to follow along with us during this exercise, please go to uh, this URL, freetrial.promap.com forward slash process workshop. And you're going to use your email address that you registered for the event uh, with as the username. And your password is going to be Nintex with a capital N. That will get you into the site. Uh, as David mentioned in the intro, the email that I sent yesterday contains a PDF that looks like this. This is the process that we will be building together. So if you want to follow along, please log into the environment. Make sure you have this PDF document open um, and we will work through that together here in a few moments. So let's come back in uh, five minutes and we will begin the exercise. Thanks, Matt. Uh, this is David, everyone. Let's just take a five minute break. Um, so it's 10 19 now. We'll round up to 10 20. Uh, yeah, 10 20. Let's get back at 10 25. Thank you.
we're going to go ahead and <clears throat> get started with our exercise. So if you would like to follow along, again, you want to make sure you are in uh, this environment. So freetrial.promap.com forward slash uh, process workshop. Uh, that we get to get you into this environment here. This is where we will be doing our exercise. Now, if you would rather just watch, that's totally fine. You don't have to do the exercise. You can watch as, uh, as I kind of go through that um, and share my screen out with everyone else. Uh, if you do want to do the exercise, you can either follow along with me at my pace, or if you are more of a self-starter, feel free to go ahead and take this exercise sheet and go ahead and get started. Work at your own pace. Uh, and see uh, see if you can finish before me. Uh, that's uh, that's great. So if you but if you want to follow along and kind of listen to to my uh, you know play by play uh, as we're going through, uh, that's also something that you can do. If you have uh, issues getting into the trial environment site, please uh, post those into chat. And uh, one of the the people, so whether it's David or uh, Nicole or Brad, can can help uh, troubleshoot those while uh, we're working through the exercise together. All right, so uh, what we're gonna do is begin building that out. I wanna point out a couple of things first as it relates to this PDF. So as we go through, you're going to see each activity is going to be in these boxes uh, in the PDF document. Uh, I've tried to add some different color for the different types of articles or objects that we'll be adding. So tasks and any documents or attachments or uh, uh, notes, things like that. But what you're going to see is that some of these tasks are going to be automated. And what that means is this is a process that um, has a workflow that's built to support this process. So it's built in the Nintex uh, workflow cloud environment. Uh, and what we're doing is we're mapping the business process to share with the business to give them their work instructions. Uh, but as part of that, we want to show where automation is built to help this process uh, facilitate the work faster. And so to do that, you're going to see these various automation tags. So hashtag Nintex automation. That is uh, a reference to a system. So anytime you see hashtag in, in orange, uh, a name of a system, whether it be Nintex automation, document generation, uh, there's also dynamics and teams here. Those are references to different systems that are being used in the process. And so just know as we go through, that's what we're doing is we're actually referencing a system that's in play, whether it be uh, automation or, or something else as we move through. So just wanted to point that out before we get started. All right, so if you're in the environment, you would like to follow along, we're gonna go ahead and create a process. So we'll go to this process dropdown and hover uh, over that, go down to the button here for creating a process. Press that. The first thing we're gonna have to do is select the group where that process is going to live. And according to our sheet, we're gonna use the ProMap training folder. So I'm just gonna click on ProMap training and press select down here at the bottom. So you can see here, we're adding a new process in ProMap training and we're gonna put in our process title or new vendor. And then I'm going to put my parentheses, uh, my name in parentheses here to, to uh, call this out as unique to me. Uh, the owner of the process is going to be myself. Uh, now, if you have Google Chrome, you're going to see some of these autofill suggestions come up. And so to you, you don't want to select from a Google autofill suggestion. You actually want to get to the ProMap dropdown. Um, and so what you want to probably do is start typing in your last name. Uh, and you'll see this dropdown uh, name in blue. That means uh, that's the name that the, is recognized in the system, and we want to select that from that drop-down list. The expert is going to be Richard Holmes, so I'll type in Richard. I'll see Richard's name pop up here, and I just select that from the drop-down. Objective is approve and add new vendors. And we don't have to build in background information at this point, that's optional. So with this core information uh, intact, the name of the process, the owner and the expert and the objective, we can go ahead and create the process. So let's go ahead and do that. Press create and ProMap is going to spin this process up. I can see Bill's already out uh, in front of me, which is great. Um, and so what we can do now is begin building in those process boundary information. So fill that out with triggers, inputs, and outputs. And so to do that, I'm going to just toggle up here to the triggers and inputs tab. And I'm going to select the button here for adding a trigger. And then I'm going to fill out this information as shown on our exercise sheet. So the situation that causes the process to start is that a new vendor is needed. 
This happens on an ad hoc frequency, but we do about 50 of these per year. So once I have this information locked in, I can press the check mark here to commit the change, and I can go down and I can add an input. Press this button to do that. It opens up the input fields. And we'll just, again, build in the information that's in the exercise sheet into these fields. So the input that we need is the new vendor request form. Now, this is, uh, in our exercise, there's not any particular process that's giving that to us. But as we mentioned before, if you're actually doing this real life, uh, real life in a production environment, you would want to make a link to any providing process. So you would want to assign a process, go out into your system and look for that process that's providing the input to you and identify that. That creates a dependency and pro map between the process I'm working on and this providing process. So it begins to help establish those cross functional relationships in the business. Now, as it were for our exercise today, we're just going to put in NA here, um, but just know that that option exists to make a link to uh, a different process in the system. And we wanted to find how this is used. Use the form to capture vendor, da uh, vendor data for review and approval. Press the check mark again to commit that change. I'm just going to go ahead and press save down here at the bottom and then jump to our outputs and targets section. Press the option here for adding an output and begin to build in this information. What have we created when we're done with this process? We have an answer that's added to dynamics and teams. Again, we're going to say NA, but if we had, you know, if this was a real life process, maybe there's a vendor management process that we would pass off to, right? So after the new vendors onboarded, they roll into our vendor management process. So we would make a link there. As it were, again, we're just going to use NA for today. So then how is this used? How is this output used? Well, because of the output, the vendor is able to collaborate with the project team. Press the check mark to commit that change. All right, so we go ahead and press save, and then that uh, rounds out our process boundary information. So we know our starting point, our triggers and inputs. We know our ending point, our output and target. And now we can build out the procedure detail that happens between those two points. And so we want to go into the procedure tab here and add our first activity. So we're going to submit the vendor request. And this is going to be performed by the project manager. So I'm going to toggle over to the role drop down list and start to type in project manager. It's going to filter that down for me, and I just select that from the role drop down. I want to build in the tasks associated to that step. So the first task is complete the new vendor request form. Uh, and that actually uh, prompts us here to let, let's get that document attached, um, right? We want to attach work instruction documents where they're relevant. Certainly, if we're telling someone that they need to fill out a form, it makes sense that we would want to attach that form at that point in the process. So to do that, we're going to hover over this paperclip icon uh, at the activity at the uh, in line with the activity name, and go down and select the document type form. Okay, attach existing document. That's what we want to do in this case. So we want to search for that new vendor request form. And this is the one we want, the docx form here. So the new vendor request form docx, let's select that and attach. So when we do that, it's going to add that form uh, as a subset underneath task A. So now I can add my next task which is facilitated by automation. So when I press this hashtag, it's going to uh, pull up a system tag dropdown list for me to choose from. So I can do two things here. I can scroll down and I can find Nintex automation and I can select it. Or if I don't want to wait for that dropdown to, uh, or to search through all of those options, I can just do hashtag and I can start to type in Nintex and it's going to filter down the options and give me less, uh, less to choose from. So this may make, make it easier for you. So I'll just select Nintex automation and I want to say we'll route to manager for approval. All right. And I'll go ahead and press the check mark. Go ahead and save that. And then we can add our next activity. 
Now you can add activities uh, through the pressing of this add activity button or you can use a keyboard shortcut alt a that will add a new activity as well. So our next one is going to be approving the vendor request and we're going to tab over to the role drop down. The manager is going to perform this. So I'm going to type in manager and then just kind of scroll down and look for that and amongst these filtered options. I see it right here. So I'll press select there to capture that and then build in our first task. Say that they're receiving the request again from Nintex Automation. So I'm going to use this hashtag uh, drop down uh, to open up the system tab, uh, the system drop down menu, and start to type in Nintex to filter down those options and select automation from that list. Next task. All right, so we're instructing the manager here to review the request. But in so doing, reference company policy because there are, again, remember policy gives us some of those must do and cannot do items. Uh, so we wanna make sure the manager's following up-to-date company policy. This is a perfect place to link in a copy of that document. If you're telling them to reference it, go ahead and provide it for them. So let's hover over that paperclip icon again. This time, instead of form, we want to go down here and select policy as the type of document that we're looking for. We want to attach a document again, and we want to search by title. We can type in vendor management, and you can see there, there's the docx that we're looking for. So vendor management policy and attach. And it's going to show up right here in the process. We can now add our third task, which is approve the vendor request. Now this uh, draws up an exception here because what's the exception to approving the request? Well, it would be denying the request. So we could, in a traditional mapping scenario, have a decision diamond that says, is it, you know, is it approved? If yes, go this way. If no, go that way. Well, I want to point out to you that if we did that, we would essentially be replacing 2.0 here. Instead of saying approved vendor request, there would be a decision diamond in a traditional map that would say, is the request approved? Question mark. Uh, if yes, we would go on to the next activity. If not, loop back, right? Well, that doesn't even allow us to give any of this additional detail, that decision diamond that's posing the question. So uh, not only is a note uh, serve to, to declutter the process map, it actually allows us to add more information. So we're decluttering the look and feel of the map while building in more information into the map. Okay, so it's really a win-win in that scenario. So uh, we want to build in the note now to capture that exception. So let's add a note and add that underneath the instruction here to approve the request. And let's just pose the exception. What if the request is not approved? Question mark. And then let's give the answer. So we're giving a straightforward uh, answer here as to what to do in that scenario. Now we can go ahead and add in our final task, which again is calling on the system Nintex automation. So hashtag Nintex to filter those options down, select automation and complete the task instructions. I'm going to go ahead and save and capture my work at this point and Alt A to add a third activity. So we're generating an NDA document. Now this is a unique step because it's not a human that's going to do it. So when I toggle over to this role dropdown, I'm not searching for a human job function. I'm actually going to type in Nintex automation because we have some automated components that are going to do this uh, generation of the document for us. So we'll select Nintex automation from the drop down list as the performer, and then add in our first task. And upon manager approval, and then now you see we're calling on a different system, a new system, uh, hashtag Nintex document generation. So document generation is going to create that NDA for us. Ask is sending it 
to the vendor for signature. All right, I'm going to go ahead and press save. Uh, if you're building the process, continue to do so. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, jump back to the map. I want to show you what this looks like so far, though, because we haven't, remember, we haven't mapped anything. We're just building out the outline of the process. But when we go to the map, we can see that ProMap is keeping up with us, right? It's mapping the process as we move along. So they're submitting the request, approving it, and then generating the vendor NDA document. We click into that, we see all of the detail that we've been building into the process. So this would be that end user view, as it were. All right, so I just wanted to give everyone a look into that as we're moving along here. All right, so we're gonna keep editing and add our fourth activity actually signing the NDA and this is going to be assigned to the vendor so when we get to that role drop down uh, we just want to type in vendor select that from the drop down list and start to add our tasks so they're going to receive the NDA from uh, Nintex automation so again hashtag to open up that system drop down start to type in Nintex to filter out the options and select that now the next task, they're going to review and execute via Nintex Sign. So this is the Nintex e-signature tool. So we're going to say hashtag uh, Nintex Sign. That's what we're looking for here. Uh, now this poses another exception because what if they have uh, issues with the wording of the NDA, right? We need to allow for that. So instead of using a decision diamond and you know creating all sorts of clutter on our map. Since this is a 20% exception, let's just build it in via a note and address that exception. And we're giving a straightforward answer here. If you don't agree, reach out to the project manager and discuss your concerns. Go ahead and save that and add in our fifth activity. We're storing the signed NDA. This is again going to be an automated activity. So this is not a human performed action. It's a uh, system performed action. So let's type in Nintex and find automation in that dropdown list. And add in the task description. Six activities, actually five, six, and seven are all automated uh, activities. So the next uh, step here is adding the vendor to Dynamics. And the text automation is going to do that as well. So to pull up Dynamics, we just want to do the same thing, hashtag, and start to type in Dynamics. And we can see here Microsoft Dynamics uh, is one of those options, and we'll select that. Press Alt-A, we can add our seventh activity here. We're posting the approved vendor notification. This is, again, performed by automation, so our workflow is doing this for us as well. And then we'll add in the task level detail. call on another system here so their automation is going to post uh, a new uh, the post that it, there's a new vendor in the approved vendors channel of Microsoft Teams so I'm going to do hashtag and start to type in Teams and I'll see Microsoft Teams filter down as an option there and add our next task So there's going to be a notification sent back to the project manager that the NDA is signed. And I'm going to save and then add in our last activity, which is a uh, human-led action where the project manager is going to add the approved vendor to Teams. All 
right? Now, if you look at the tasks here for activity 8.0, they're very uh, kind of granular click level type instructions. This would be something, uh, you know, maybe not necessary for this level of detail, but uh, it certainly wouldn't hurt, especially if it, if it was any longer than this, uh, where you could use the uh, screenshot video capability, right? And add a quick video screenshot of someone actually doing this for a, a new vendor in Teams and then upload that video to this uh, process step as a supplemental uh, attachment. out the last bit of this task level instruction. All right, and press save. And so what we're going to see is that uh, based on this outline that we built, if we go back to our process map tab, if we uh, followed the document, you should have a process that looks uh, something like this at a high level. Or, uh, you know, if you weren't able to get through all of that, uh, however far you, you got, you should see that, that same basic layout uh, where we start with the submission of the request. The manager approves that. Uh, automation generates a document for signature. The vendor takes action and signs that. Uh, and then automation stores that document for us, adds the vendor to Dynamics, posts uh, a notification in the Teams channel. And then a project manager closes out the process by adding that vendor uh, to Teams. Uh, so that is... It's as simple as that to, to build a process. I think that took us, um, you know, what was that, 15 or 20 minutes, something like that. Not long to work through that. Uh, if you have the information, you can go very quickly from uh, process a uh, process kind of scratched on, out on a piece of paper to uh, an actual map that can be used and then uh, sent out for comments and feedback. So hopefully you found that uh, fairly simple uh, to engage with. Uh, any questions from anyone that was that was doing the exercise or anyone that was just observing as to how the edit tool functions. Does that make sense to everybody? Any comments or questions about that? Okay, one thing I wanna point out is when you do get to this level uh, in the editor, and you may have seen this if you're actually doing the exercise, uh, everything in here is, is drag and drop. So if you wanted to rearrange these activities, you can move this information around uh, and ProMap is very agile and allow you, you to do that. You can take these, uh, these different documents or articles and you can move this around and actually change them and move them to different steps if you needed to do that. Um, so very simple to manipulate this information once you get it uh, into the editor. Now, uh, what we could do, I want to show you just an example of really what might be possible if you were wanting to kind of go the next step and actually link in uh, the workflow. So we mentioned that there's, you know, we're referencing automation in this process. Well, if we actually made a link between the workflow that's running this process and the process map itself, what would that look like? And so just to give you an idea of what that looks like, I've, I've actually done that. Uh, already in advance and just want to give you an idea of what that process would do now in that case. So you would have uh, a process that that looks very similar. It contains those same core steps, but anything that's autonomously handled through automation would now be uh, designated visually with this orange header. And so that's a visual cue for me that this is automated. Uh, and so I can see that uh, the tasks within that step are automated as well. Uh, but even the, uh, the human-led actions that are assisted by automation, there's still going to be a visual call out here. And so here's an example where the project manager is going to complete the new vendor request form, but that form is going to be submitted or routed via automation. So there's this black text uh, that designates the, the manual involvement and then the orange text that indicates that there's automation assisting the, the process at this point. Uh, you can even go as far as to link in uh, a copy of the automated form. So uh, 
the paper form that we attached to the process that we were building would be replaced by the automated form that would kick off uh, the workflow that would be running uh, to support the, the completion of this process. So uh, you can even take it uh, as far as this, if you would like to bring again, consistency and, and synergy between your standard process instructions that your human actors are referencing in ProMap and the workflows that your IT professionals are building in your workflow designer to support the business process. So this is kind of how it all comes together uh, in ProMap and what that would look like for the end user. Um, so just wanted to show you that that's something that's possible. That's a possibility out there. Uh, and I know that our friends at Able would be uh, more than happy to, to help you figure out how to uh, and get this sort of end result with uh, some of your business processes. So uh, we've got 10 minutes left <clears throat> and we have a couple couple more things to, to close out. Um, one of them is going to be uh, give you an opportunity to um, uh, win a, a wonderful Nintex uh, backpack. So if, <clears throat> if that's something that uh, would be of interest to you, we would just ask you to, uh, as we kind of go through the next steps and kind of close things out here that you would fill out uh, the survey for this event form, help us uh, understand what, what can we do to make these more uh, beneficial for you? Uh, what do we need to add to, to, to really make these things valuable? What do we need to make sure that we keep in that, that you found really valuable? Let us know that feedback uh, and that just helps us get better. We would appreciate that. What I'll do before we sign off uh, at the top of the hour is I'll run a random uh, generator to see who, uh, out of those of you who submitted a survey, uh, it's gonna pick a random winner and then I'll let you know uh, who that winner is. It's gonna get the backpack. So if you would like to do that, please go ahead and go to that URL and fill that out. Uh, and what I'll do also, because I wanna toggle over uh, slides here, is I'll put that URL uh, in the chat bar so you can just go to the chat and follow that survey link. And so with that, uh, David, if you uh, wouldn't mind talking about uh, next steps for everyone here. So they've seen uh, ProMap, they have, we, we've talked about the necessity of process management uh, for really a foundation for automation or anything digital transformation. Uh, if they're interested in, in you know, continuing further, going down those next steps, getting a trial of ProMap, maybe getting some assistance from the experts over at ABLE, uh, how would they go about doing that? Sure, thanks, Matt. Um, hope everyone, uh, you know, got some really good um, insights into just you know processes in general, and specifically uh, ProMap and and how to leverage uh, that technology to um, to easily map processes. Which, as as Matt pointed out there towards the end, you know, the next step in that is is to then uh, add automation uh, via forms and workflow and uh, document generation, uh, digital signatures, all those all those things that are part of the broader uh, Nintex platform. Um, so yeah, we're, we'd, um, we'd love the opportunity to, um, to connect with you and answer questions that you might have, um, explore uh, you know, deploying a free trial and and you know getting some assistance from us to do that. Um, we'll be reaching out to the folks that uh, participated here on the session today and um, and you know offer a a time when we can talk about what your interests are, what your needs are, and um, uh, yeah, and then you know we'll we'll go from there. But that'll be the immediate follow up. Is is a message that goes out to the participants, and um, you know please let us know uh, any questions that you have and and how the Nintex and Enable Solutions team uh, can assist you with that. Great, thanks, David. So I want to uh, make sure that uh, everyone who wants to be entered into that drawing for the backpack gets a chance to fill out the survey. So. Uh, going to give a few more minutes uh, for those to come in. Um, any questions or comments though, feel free to unmute yourselves. I know that it's it's been kind of a quiet group. We've had a, a couple comments come through chat, but um, any comments or questions on on what you saw today, uh, that would uh, that would be wonderful to, to hear. So please feel free to ask those if, if you have any.
Hey, Matt, this is David. I don't know if um, uh, I don't recall uh, it being mentioned, but um, maybe just can you say a quick word on um, how ProMap is um, is licensed? Yeah, yeah, certainly. So uh, ProMap is, is not licensed per user, uh, like a lot of uh, different systems out there. We don't want to penalize uh, you for having people use the system. So we license on a per process basis. Uh, the starting point would be uh, 100 processes. That's kind of entry level uh, for organizations. Uh, and you know, depending on, on several other factors, the, the starting point for that is uh, around 15K annually for 100 processes. Uh, there would also be some onboarding uh, that would be part of that initial purchase, which would be a separate one-time cost uh, that would allow you to team up with uh, uh, you know, an expert uh, someone uh, you know at able that would be able to walk you through uh, the solution and help you you know establish it and get it configured and get your people trained uh, for success with the with the tool uh, question here how long will the process workshop be available uh, good question uh, it'll be available probably through tomorrow um, what I would encourage you to do though uh, is to go to uh, nintex.com uh, I'll actually grab the link and put it in the chat here in a minute and you can sign up for your own free trial uh, and that actually gets to what David was talking about. Uh, we would be happy to connect with you and to help you get started using that trial, uh, whether that's uh, giving you a quick walkthrough and then also helping you map out a couple of your processes in the trial so that you have uh, some business relevant content that you can share with your coworkers and uh, the decision makers in your business, uh, we're happy to help you uh, do that. So that would be the, the next uh, step if you want to have your own environment. And that environment would be uh, live for 30 days. Uh, so after you sign up for a trial, you'd have 30 days uh, access to that. And I'll grab the link and put that in the chat for anyone who is interested. Sure, and the other, uh, Matt, the other <clears throat> common question that we, we get is, um, you know, we focus say on ProMap, which is uh, is cloud based. Um, but if folks have either uh, on premises or Office 365, Microsoft 365 based environment where they're they might or might not be leveraging um, forms and workflow, uh, you know, whether in Intex or otherwise, uh, does it matter? Um, is there a, a compatibility? consideration there or is it is it pretty much a platform agnostic uh, pro map is is totally agnostic I mean, it's cloud-based so you're not you know you're not dependent upon uh, Microsoft or, or SharePoint to to make it happen um, mm -hmm. so yeah agnostic in that sense okay thanks very much everyone take care <laughs>